Okay, well, there's only five of us at the moment, so we'll wait for Cynthia to come back in. I think I'm just going to start. Huh. Let's see, because we don't have anybody else in here, but anyway, so we're going to go ahead and start. So welcome to Celebrating Diversity and Spurring Innovation. As we emerge from COVID-19 crisis, we have a unique opportunity as we, ensure, as we ensure that gender, age, sexual orientation, different abilities, racial, religious, and political identity, and all other for, forms of human diversity are accepted in business and society. How to implement diversity and inclusion at leadership level, and how can diversity inspire innovation? I am Vanessa Reye, your chair for this panel. I am a cultural strategist, sometimes angel investor, former cultural attaché of Mexico in the UK, and now chief strategy officer at Buffalo Grid, a company that will bring power and connect the next billion. So I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping, if anybody shows up. We're going to post comments on the panel, on the question chat box on the side, and then I can share them with the speakers. So joining us, we have, well, not Cynthia, but from Turkey, Jeren Çerçiler, founder and CEO of Insight Councils, a company dedicating to creating synergies and bringing business together around the same cause or project. She also has been a commercial representative of CNN International for Turkey and Angola, where she led to build the first diplomatic relationships between the two countries. She has, she has then dedicated her career to building business liaisons and establishing diplomatic relations between countries and the private sector. She is also a producer and has very notable talents to her name. From Denmark, Michelle Deloren, partner at Better Organizations, a management consultancy, creating transparency for CEOs, uncovering uh, divergent perceptions of status, ambitions, and likelihood for change among managers. He has, uh, he has had C-level positions in some of the world's largest international maritime transport companies, a role that has taken him to live in Egypt, Taiwan, Singapore, Philippines, Thailand, Japan, and now Slovenia. From Costa Rica, we have Cynthia Castro, co-founder of Boomerang Effect Latin America, a company that builds business strategies to close gender and diversity gaps in nine countries in the region. She was elected as one of the most powerful women of Central America by Forbes and is a global shaper of the World Economic Forum. Cynthia founded the Gender Equality and Competitiveness Program for the public and private sector, accomplishing the first certification of gender equal organizations in Costa Rica. From Israel, we have Vered Punelli, a researcher, writer, and lecturer of the subject of media, design, and digital games culture, with extensive experience in designing and developing media products for academic and business purposes. She is the co-founder of Senkar Game, Game Design Program at Senkar College of Engineering and Design, where she served as <clears throat> head of business development and a founding director of the management committee at their Center for Innovation and Development. From the Netherlands, we have Gesche van Haren. She runs her own media organization, Vers Pers, for over 16 years. She is the driving force behind the Lost in Europe project and leads a growing team of journalists in Europe. She has extensive experience as a media producer and teaches, teaches investigative journalism, entrepreneurship, and photography. Also, the founder of investigative journalism private school Open Eyes Amsterdam and since 2016 coordinates the board network, the broad network, correct? Focused on stimulating mainstream media in the Netherlands to increase diversity in editorial rooms and across the board. So just before we start, I'm going to ask each one of the panelists to describe themselves using four adjectives from the title of our talk. So Jeden, will you please start? Four adjectives. Well, I mean, diverse definitely would be a one adjective that I would use for myself. Um, um, I would use um, innovative for sure, uh, because, you know, throughout my career, I had to be very creative would be another one. Uh, I had to be very creative. And <laughs> Can so you just give us the four words and then we'll get no, into the details? So innovative, creative, diverse, 
and a little crazy. <laughs> Michel? Well, I guess it would be international, given my more than 20 years of living outside of my neighbors in Denmark, and it would be being an egalitarian, and then uh, having an international outlook, and uh, being a, uh, a somewhat of a family man, having two daughters uh, in the mid-20s. Okay, Geshe? Uh, yeah, I choose some other words, but I'm a non-charismatic pioneer, so uh, that's a problem. And uh, I'm a woman and also sometimes dissenting, so uh, that's, uh, that's my four, four words. Cynthia? Can you listen to me now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I would say women, uh, diverse, migrant, since I, uh, as a Latin American, grew up in the United States, and disruptive. Got it. Well, I would say probably an activist, entrepreneur, cosmopolitan in a way, and an uh, innovator. Fantastic. So just to make a note, I think that's super interesting because this does refer to the people on the panel that think more about inclusion rather than exclusion, potential, not limitations, and appreciation, not tolerance. Because normally, if you were to ask that question, you would get the very straightforward words of, you know, female in tech or non-binary, the words that actually put us back into boxes that doesn't help us progress. So just to begin, I want to define two terms, diversity as the collective mixture of differences and similarities, and inclusion, the achievement of an environment in which all individuals are treated fairly and respectfully. So we all know the stats, you know, in 2019, the proportion of women in senior management roles globally grew 29%. There is no country in the world that has achieved gender, gender parity in wages, even the top rank ones, as we discussed with Michelle, that have this included in their constitution. Now, diversity in tech is a very interesting one because you've got 0.2% non-binary, 27% women, 73% men, and even more shocking, 65% white. Asian, 23%, black, 3%, 6% Latinx, and 0.3% uh, indigenous. So this is another interesting fact that since the death of George Floyd, Facebook has committed an additional 10 million to groups working on racial justice. Google announced a 175 million plus economic opportunity package to support black business owners, startup founders, job seekers, and developers, and YouTube, a 100 million fund to amplify black creators and artists. To more companies with below average diversity scores reported an average innovation revenue of 26%, whereas companies with above average diversity scores reported 45% average innovation revenues. People are living longer and healthier lives. In 2018, the 50 plus demographic in the US contributed to 40% of the GDP. And there is substantial evidence that LGBT people are limited in their human rights in ways that also create economic harms. So this is just very clear that diversity is something that needs to be addressed and tackled with action, not just words. So the first question is for Cynthia. What are the common errors of diversity and inclusion strategies, and what are the best practices to follow? First, I believe that sometimes people confuse diversity with inclusion, and you can be diverse without being inclusive. So mm -hmm. let's say you can say you have people of different race or different ages, nationalities, um, you have 50% men or women in their organization, but are they sitting at the table where the decisions are being made? And that's actually inclusion. Where are they? In which tables? How are they participating? And also, um, a big issue is that organizations tend to invest on empowering minorities. And this kind of creates a message that it's a lack of empowerment what is creating the gap with this group and actually what the studies have shown us and the future of jobs to report of the world economic forum shows us is that unconscious bias of decision makers are the thing that are creating these gaps. So we need to measure how this unconscious bias is affecting the organization in order to action plans. The other issue is that 
in the United States, we're investing per year $8 billion on diversity training. And more than a thousand studies have been replicated now that show no correlation between uh, bringing down unconscious bias and training. There's a high color correlation, though, which is a good news, between having contact with outgroup members or having contact with counter stereotypical leaders. So if you really want to close your gaps in the organization and change unconscious bias, more than training, what you need to do is include diversity at your C-levels, at the top levels of the organization. And that interaction with those leaders, it was it's going to really make a change. And it's going to cost you less money than all those training, diversity training um, events you're organizing in your company. Fantastic. Thank you, Cynthia. Michelle, following on that, what is the return on investment of diversity and inclusion strategies? Well, I think you initially you mentioned some, some figures you know, yourself. Uh, there are numerous studies that could be mentioned. I mean, uh, PCG have said that the gender balance management teams have a 38% more uh, revenue from innovation, that uh, balance boards have, uh, this is from Forbes, balance boards have a 33% higher profit probability of having above average returns. And, and the list really goes on. And you, what I think should be the interesting topic is not whether it's 33% or 31 or 25 or whatever it may be. I think historically a lot of companies have restrained themselves from pursuing diversity because it's very, it's probably easier to calculate the actual cost saying that if we initiate this program, it's going to cost $50,000. When are we going to get it back? But by now we have more than a decade of results coming out, whether it's from BCG, whether it's from McKinsey, whether it's from Forbes and Peterson Institute and so forth. So now I believe it, it's no longer an excuse. You can't say that, that it doesn't make sense. There's the humanitarian side where it should principally just make sense to you that of course you should be pursuing diversity. But there are so many studies now that the question should not be a discussion on whether it's 13% or 33. It just makes sense for business as well. And if you don't believe in the figures, then try and look at it from other perspectives on, on uh, opening every year when, when CEOs are asked around the world on what are the biggest challenges that they have. One thing appears just about every year, no matter when they are asked, and that is the fight for talent. That, that is attracting, training, and retaining talent. And if you really have a true diversity plan, you open up for a much larger talent pool. It gives you access to a number of people that you haven't pursued in the past. And then perhaps this issue of becoming an employer of choice becomes much easier to pursue something that many companies state that they would like to be looked at as. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Michelle. And Veren, gaming, other media and content industries are dominated by white males. What changes have you seen in the last years in your specific sector and where is the change coming from? Well, we did see in recent years a, a major change, actually, in the ways that companies approach women and a little change in the ways they address people with disabilities or LGBTs. So generally speaking, if you look at the statistics, you will see that almost in every country, there are nearly equal number of female gamers and male gamers. We're talking about 46% are female gamers. Their average age is uh, 34, while 54% are male gamers. So the average wow. age is... 32. So it's not really, you know, true to say anymore that women don't play games or there's a gap. But the reason for this is mainly because the technology has changed. Mm -hmm. So on average, more than 60% of the gamers, they play on mobile devices. And the most popular game genre is casual, like Candy Crush. So these are games that are easy to play with and easy to use. So And also we have more uh, female millennials who grew up with this technology and they feel like it is like a central medium for them for entertainment. Mm -hmm. However, in terms of employment, uh, unfortunately things haven't changed much. So presently, if you look at the statistics, women only make up 22% of the video game industry. And this is a huge industry. This is a $60 billion industry. And the main reason for this is that men still continue to dominate all the technical fields. And those are the skills that actually pay well. So until we have more encouragement for women to study STEM in school or to learn how to code, this gap will stay. I mean, well, that's very interesting. Keshe, 
Um, what, how has fake news in, impacted our perception and beliefs of others and ourselves when referring to diversity and inclusion in general? It's what you see in, in, um, in newsrooms that uh, they're still in the Dutch newsrooms uh, is very uh, homogene uh, uh, group uh, working there. And what we see there is that there, uh, when post-its um, of fake news are coming in and, and um, getting their new normal news uh, uh, in an attack, they don't know what to do. There is a lot of uncertainty with uh, the group of, of um, journalists that work uh, in newsroom. And that is, I'm talking about the, the, the biggest national newsrooms where we work with. Um, what you see is that, that if you increase diversity in those newsrooms uh, and have a, a common uh, uh, ground uh, discussion about what is posted by robots and by, by uh, all kinds of attackers, that uh, when you have people with different backgrounds and with different uh, knowledge that they know what is what makes sense and what not. Uh, if this this group uh, of, of people isn't um, uh, diverse or I inclusive, uh, then you see that that um, uh, they the, the newsrooms act the, the, the wrong way that they uh, uh, they feel that they are really under attack and that and they go in a defensive uh, modus and and that's when when uh, uh, yeah stuff from robots and from fake news pops up in the in the mainstream news um, but also is the problem is that uh, most reporters and and people in the fields were uh, working in the fields are actually di more diverse and, and it's getting better. But then uh, we're talking about leadership here. The chief uh, in the in the uh, newsroom is actually making, uh, uh, deciding that day what is news and what is not. And uh, if, if that leader isn't, um, uh, has, hasn't uh, his, his uh, um, uh, um, fingers in the field, then he still makes this this, this uh the same decisions uh that, that goes wrong and and it's in in the Netherlands it's really a problem for for uh national media uh with will all kinds of attacks of 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 robots but also um uh, the comp comp conspiracy uh theories that that make it into the ma mainstream news uh, and therefore a more inclusive newsroom is 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 uh, yeah it's, it's a way of living for for organizations thank you and jaren from diplomacy to production in high level business how have things changed through the years since you started your career so you're going to have to do that in two minutes. <laughs> a lot has changed, uh, thankfully. Uh, to start with production, um, we didn't see any male produce, um, female producers in the past. It was completely male dominant. And uh, over the past uh, five uh, years, uh, more and more female producers have been uh, emerging with amazing uh, work and amazing uh, uh, reception uh, from the international public as well. In the business world, when I started in 2005 and I was only 24 years old and you know, I was in Africa as a woman on my own, uh, I had just launched my company, you know, uh, it, everybody thought it was a, I had a huge group behind me. Nobody could believe that it was my own. Everybody thought I had this um, you know, either a government, like they thought I had the Turkish government behind me or a big conglomerate. No, I was on my own, but they just couldn't handle it. They couldn't understand it. Now, when I, when I am working in the business arena as a woman, yes, it is received more positively, but still it is, it is, it's a, it's a matter of mindset. I think it's the whole process of inclusion, uh, whether it's gender or LGBT, or race or whatever. It's about um, how are you? It's very emotional, actually. It's about somebody from wherever that person is from saying, I belong. You, it's about belonging, actually. It's a very emotional topic, and we don't see it as an emotional topic. We don't see it as, as something that comes from the way uh, we 
grew up, from where we grew up, which family we were born into. It is very personal. And I think it is a neural activity in our minds as well. It's a very scientific neural brain activity. And I think we should have neuroscientists looking into this because um, it's about the filters that we have in our minds. The minute you look at something, you make judgments. And because we're constantly making judgments, uh, we see uh, a person of a different color immediately. We're like, oh, that person's different from me. That person doesn't belong to my group. So uh, it's about breaking that. It's about breaking the filters that are in the minds of people, which is very difficult. But I, I think this can be achieved only by regulations in you know, our generation, but with the new generation, because they're into, born into a different reality, we can see a change that is much higher than what we have experienced ourselves. Amazing. Thank you. So now I'm going to put the questions out to the entire panel. Um, so the first one being, in the moment of all these changes around workplace inclusion and diversity, do you feel C-suites are doing enough about developing more cohesive, collaborative, and creative working environments to continue driving growth? Just kind of give me a little signal to see who wants to go first. Well, I can I can maybe make a comment on that. I think it's it's interesting that that Selim did brings up this issue of whether uh, there should be reg regulatory uh, things uh, be, be being put in put in place. And I think I actually support that, but it's a very contagious issue on whether there should be laws governing the, these areas. But I think that if we if we look at the basic human perspective, and that hasn't been driving things fast enough. If we then look at what has happened with the evidence that we've seen over the last decade, and then look at the speed of change, we shouldn't accept the speed of change as it is. And I think that just unfortunately points towards the necessity of having a legal framework in place. That's not the only thing that should be there. It should be, of course, supported by the private sector doing their own part of it. But I don't think that we will attain the speed which is required to truly change things. In Denmark is often being mentioned as, as, a, as a good example of a country that is making progress. Mm -hmm. But also here, if we just look at gender, gender equality, it'll take another 100 years before we have that in the workplace. It's simply not an acceptable speed. Nobody should accept that men or women alike. And because it also makes business sense, I support a regulatory environment. And then also that's supported by a number of the things that the businesses can do themselves. Do any of the other panelists please vent? Yeah, yeah. I would just say from a video game perspective, but also from a general media perspective, uh, what I see is that when uh, we have more government support, I don't know if legislation, but more government support and like grants, uh, um, we see a prosperity in, uh, in in new things. And if we have more grants and and governmental support uh, to produce, for instance, for the video games. To produce uh, gaming with uh, inclusive contents or, or having some inclusive uh, employment, uh, that could be very beneficial. And wherever we have it, we can see the difference. Anybody else? Cynthia? I would like to add a big issue in Latin America uh, with paternity leave. So we have maternity leave, but no paternity leave in a lot of the country. And many governments are not willing to support that. And the thing is, you're always going to have discrimination against women, even if it's illegal, because companies will continue to discriminate them as seeing them as a higher cost instead of men. So if we're not willing to approve also legislation that puts us on the same position, it's not it, we're not going to advance quick enough. The World Economic Forum says that there's 277 no, 57 years before we reach gender parity on economic, on um, the economic gap. And that's uh, previous to COVID-19 and that now it's slower. So I agree with what Mitchell says that it's going too slow. It's just going too slow. And the thing is, um, we're not advancing on policy making. The last elections in Costa Rica were practically about who's in favor or who's against same-sex marriage. So, like, there there was no other issue that mattered. It was just, like, very controversial, and the election was about that. I know something similar happened in Brazil, and it has been happening around the world. So I feel that there's a very important role for public policy, and we're not doing enough. I want to take that point to uh, to uh, Geshe, <clears throat> because, it, you know, the, the elections in Costa Rica were pretty much based on same-sex marriage. So just bring it over from the media perspective, and then we'll go to the next question, if that's okay. 
uh, yeah, the media perspective on same-sex marriage, or what, what is the no, the media perspective of the impact of you know a, a conversation to, around? I mean, we're now gone into politics, but just very quickly in a minute, the impact of the media in these sorts of outcomes because it affects <laughs> legislation. It does, it does. Yeah, I agree on that. Um, and therefore, you also need a, a, a more inclusive or a mo more diverse newsroom uh, because you have to uh, hold uh, the responsible into account uh, and, and give another uh, story about what, what, uh, what happens in politics. Uh, we, we are not here to reproduce what they say, but uh, we are here to, to give uh, the, the, the other views and the other perspectives. And yeah, that is missing a lot. The, the, uh, uh, we, yeah. Thank you. So we're going to go from, you know, we, we ended up in politics and I want to bring it back to C-suite level, which is speaking about quotas in the context of companies. So keeping it within a company. So what are your feelings of quotas? Are they solving a problem or are they making a bigger difference within companies and corporations? Jared. Well, I think, uh, especially post-COVID, one thing that businesses saw is that you need to be more open to uh, new markets. You have to explore new markets. You, you have to explore new areas. And in order to be able to do that, the more, more diverse a team you have, the more understanding you're going to be able to uh, generate when you're dealing with people from different cultures. But do you agree with quotas? Is that something companies should do? I understand that you agree with quotas. I do agree. There should be quotas, at least to give it a push. I, I, I do agree. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, I agree on, on, on having quotas, but I think it's important to remember that quotas may push diversity. Quotas do not push inclusion. And you have to address both of them. I think it, when Nika White in the U.S., uh, who, Dr. Nika White, who is uh, a recognized authority on inclusive leadership, have said that, quote, unquote, winning teams are built through an equitable approach that gives people what they need, not by treating everyone equally. So I think it's, it's so I support quotas for what we can do, but it has to be combined with, with true inclusion and leadership as well. And, and given the fact that we live in a world which will largely extent designed by men, I think there's another a couple of angles that have to be approached simultaneously with the quotas. But if quotas are not there, then I think it's going to go too slow. So I've got, we've got a question here from Marjana who says, do all female participants also support law enforcement for gender balance in management boards? So do the female participants support law enforcement for gender balance in management boards? That's a very tricky question. Yes. <laughs> a very tricky question because, um, you know, women should not have a place in uh, whatever management position out of gender, but out of their merits. It should be merit-based. If a woman is going to be in a management position, it's because she actually is eligible for that position and she has enough experience and enough knowledge uh, for that position. So it's a very um, tricky um um, question. Yes, there should be balance, but it should be marriage-based, not gender-based. I'm going to now bring it to Cynthia. Yeah, I, I want to debate that a little bit because there's studies that show that if you have the same resume and you just <laughs> you have everything exactly the same, one is called John, one is called Jennifer, John will get more opportunities and John will receive a higher salary. And even though they have the same experience. So it's interesting that we worry that women get into leadership positions without um, deserving it. But how many men have also got into these positions just because of being a male? Yeah. So it's interesting that we tend to be very careful about this when we're talking about women. But when we see the data of studies, that's what's going on with men. So I think quotas is interesting because what we've seen with studies about gender bias from behavioral sciences is when you expose women to a women in leadership roles, the bias decreases and more of them aspire to that. So it's kind of the a first step for, for more women and for men also to see women in these positions 
But it's not enough, as Mitchell says. If I don't change my recruiting strategy, if I don't change the biases on the way I'm uh, evaluating people in the organization, quotas is not going to change everything. It's not going to be enough. But I think it's interesting how we worry about women not deserving to be on the table when many men, just because of having a, a male name on the resume, get there also. So just to say that we've done our bird, merits are, un are an underlying condition. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So if it, let it please, and then Gigi, and just if you can make it quick so we can go to the next question. I'll make it very quick. I completely support what you said, and I think quotas actually uh, will encourage more inclusive, more inclusiveness eventually. So it will push it to, to this way. Vet it. <clears throat> I mean, Gigi. Uh, yeah, very quick. Um, I, I do agree and I, I disagree on, qu on quotes and, and uh, conditions, but uh, because when you get in, it's, it's also hard to stay in. Uh, most people who are forced to get in uh, uh, and are expected to be a role model uh, and then they fail. So, um, or, or the, the group lets them fail. So, so there, there is, yeah, another track after that. Okay. <clears throat> so do you feel, and this is an interesting one. So from where you're sitting, CC leaders, you know, positions of leadership yourself, do you feel that the lockdown and impact of COVID has reinforced the value of human connections and somehow supported this inclusiveness since We're all in a major global situation that affects all of us mostly equally. So I'm just curious to know if you believe that COVID has had some kind of impact at reinforcing a human connection that goes beyond seeing one another from the from the perspective of um, diversity. So in, in the beginning, uh, totally yes. Uh, so so in in uh, in the Netherlands, we we had a lockdown in March. Uh, we were quite late, but uh, we were in, in March, uh, locked up. And um, then everyone was in the same position. I really felt uh, a, a really good working environment because I was talking with uh, with men who uh, suddenly also had their kids in, in, in uh, sitting in their, in their laps. And, and we were all, oh, like, yeah, those are your kids. Oh, that, these are mine. And, and that was really a great situation because we were all in the same, uh, same position then. Uh, um, but then when the schools reopened and uh, our kids, uh, that, that, that took for, for six weeks or something like that, and um, all the kids were back to school and everyone had, had, had his normal pattern again, uh, being in lockdown, then, yeah, it was tough. But because now I am the only one sitting with my kids at home <laughs> and the others are all having their kids at school and, and back in their uh, program again. So, yeah. So, let me, I'm going to bring this question to Michelle and to Cynthia next. And then the next one I want to focus on uh, Vedid and Jeden. So, Cynthia, what do you think from, you know, your customers, the, the, the people you advise, the companies you advise, the same thing for you, Michelle. Have you seen that this COVID situation somehow you know, soften the situation or put us all on a more equal playing field? Yes and no, I would say. Um, what we've seen is that men are having more time with their family, and that's very positive. So they're more involved with their kids, for example. But females are suffering. They have increased their household work 2.5 hours per day. They are more interrupted when they're working from home than male. And they, there's a study of McKinsey that says that uh, women have 1.8 more possibility of losing their job during this pandemic than uh, males. So there is a, a gap that sometimes is invisible. For example, organizations implement work from home as if everybody li lived in equal conditions. Not everybody has an office where they can work away from what, what coming what's going on around in the house. Not everybody has the same conditions. And mm -hmm. it kind of puts us in the same condition. That's what we believe from what we see on the screen. But not everybody is working in the same condition. And I was actually reading something interesting also about race and uh, Zoom meetings and how um, having an open camera where you can see the background of a black family is affecting black members because of bias. 
So it's very interesting because I think it has its pros and cons. Okay. And Michelle? Well, I, I can only agree with what Cindy is saying. We also see a number of countries where domestic violence has been on the increase because all of a sudden you've had these... The, the Sorry, Michelle, can I ask you to please, you know, the, to keep to the idea of how it, this has impacted C-suite leaders to actually humanize processes and somehow from the leadership position, not from what we're all suffering, which we've already touched upon. But I, Do but I, don't, I, 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 don't think, I don't think in isolation it changes anything. And I think that it's very dangerous to think that just because a COVID-19 situation in principle should open up for opportunities, it won't open up for any opportunities in this field by itself. What made sense, what makes sense now when it comes to equality and diversity also made sense long before COVID-19 situation came along. And that wasn't yeah. enough to drive things. So COVID is not going to change anything at all. And I think it's very dangerous to think that all of a sudden these problems are going to somehow solve themselves or get better just because of this tragic situation that we're in. So I'm going to ask two more questions. Uh, what are the new boundaries or possibilities of inclusion? Can I start, okay, sorry, sorry, go on, please. Yeah, I just want to say one tiny remark that the video game industry is actually booming, obviously, after uh, post-COVID-19, yes. Everybody's playing games and they're in the house. So we have more audiences actually getting in there, not just uh, um, the, young, the young men, also like older women. This is like a very big audience that is a twice. And uh, I have uh, my friends who are 40 something calling me like, what can you recommend me? What kind of game to play? So this will probably have an impact actually on, um, okay. on, the, on the new games that they're going to play okay, and design. Amazing. So speaking about, well, we lost Michelle, but speaking, yeah. he'll come back. So speaking about, you know, having an impact in a game and more of your friends talking about, uh, you know, recommending games. So we've got a very diverse uh, group here, and I just thought, like, to almost play a game. So we've got, you know, Bennett, who does video games and programming and everything. So could all of us actually, instead of just talking about this, which is what normally tends to happen in these circumstances, come up with an idea where, for example, you can design a game for C-suite leaders. You know, uh, Jeden could definitely produce the whole thing behind it, We've got uh, Gisha can provide the real and relevant news or what needs to be featured <laughs> where there's no fake news involved. And Michelle and Cynthia can actually push this out to, you know, CEOs and heads of human resources and the people that need to have it. How would that look? Like, would this be possible at all? So, Vered, I'm going to start with you because you would be the architect of this idea. Well, that's perfect. It's a business plan, I think. <laughs> I exactly. have had, had several people coming to me uh, with ideas about games uh, because they are now exposed to this. I would, be, I would this be, that would definitely have a new target audience. And once you have a new target audience, like we say, like a new persona, the game yeah. is going to be completely different. I would say it will has more uh, liberal views, obviously. Uh, less violent teams, more meaningful experiences, what we call. Okay, so now I'm going to bring it over to Gizhi because you would be making sure the content is real. This, we're making something here. <laughs> yeah, or, or that the content has uh, several uh, perspectives uh, because you need to know what, what, uh, yeah, what perspectives there are so you can make up your mind for your own, which one makes sense, and you can play with that. Um, it's also, I would let it um, more uh, have a discussion with the group in the middle, the middle group, instead of um, uh, having those, this far end uh, uh, perspective and, and a far end on, on the other, uh, other way. So um, it, it would be a bit boring because it's a normal conversation um, uh, in, in the game. Sorry for that, but we need no, that. We need, no, we need no, a conversation with the middle. The people, the people, playing, the game, the people yeah. playing the game will be the, the C-suites. But we need the cooperation of everybody through an organization to be able to make this properly. 
Okay, so then I'm going to, Jenin, you're going to do the whole advertising and production, so I'll come to you at the end. Michelle, so what, how would you push something like this, a solution like this, the, the video game that we can make, this group that is on this screen? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I lost everybody, and I'm having connection issues right now. So, so I heard the question, but not the, the few minutes that went before that. So I'm afraid if I'm going to answer now, I'm going to answer the wrong thing. No, so we, well, recap. So Vered said that it is definitely possible. Uh, Gija said we need to include the middle management and people throughout an organization to be able to have the real content that we would need to have in this application or in this resource that we're talking about making. And so now the question is to you, would you be able to push something like this out directly to the C-suites that you work with? And actually, another question for you two, Cynthia and Michelle, would it, there be a market out there for it? Uh, uh, I'm sorry because I lost the connection. A market for what? I'm, I'm just holding. Just, just Cynthia, maybe back. you can pick it up, Cynthia, please. I think there's a market out for it because there's a lot of uh, certifications now where um, C level and corporate are competing to try to market themselves at the, as the most diverse place to work. The problem with what's outside there, it's a lot of it is like just pledge that you want to be equal and have inclusion, but there's no accountability. And I think that would be interesting in the game to have that accountability and have those measurements. Because the thing is when you have things like uh, he for she, where CEOs sign that they're going to support gender equality, you have a moral licensing effect. Where just by signing these, this, people think they're doing enough, but they're not doing. So I think a game could help <laughs> accountability. Great. And now, Jed, and because we've just got three minutes left. So how would you make this a mainstream thing? Well, actually, uh, I would do a juxtaposition. I would go the before and the after. Like any documentary, you look at the reality of it and then you, you point out what changes, right? So, um, for instance, uh, using AI, it is possible now. Um, for instance, they attached AI to Facebook. And uh, after that, they saw that the AI was xenophobic, uh, was Matista, uh, you know, every bad aspect you can think of, the AI had captured it from Facebook. So it would be interesting to do that in a company, see what that AI turns into, and then through the game, we could see the change. We could see the before and the after. That would be great impact, and that would be a great analysis, a great study. And then most companies would probably be eager to try it out themselves. I will just add to that, this is a wonderful idea, that the, the, the biggest problem that companies face now is the loneliness of people. Mm. People work from home, they're isolated, they're cubicles like here, they're very lonely, you don't have any water cooler uh, talks. And uh, I know several people who got hired to a company, they've never met their co-workers, uh, they don't have any chance actually to, to network and to communicate. So games uh, are really good tools you know, to defeat loneliness and to connect between people as well. Okay, so good good. No, yes. this sounds great. Guys, I think we might have an after-school activity for this group. Oh, yes. I'm, you know, I'm touching <laughs> upon what was discussed in our practice, which was, you know, I think it was pretty much unanimously said that all of these things normally end up with a lot of talk, a lot of talk, a lot of talk, very little action, and then change is staggered or, or very slow to happen. So, I mean, from my part, I'm super happy to volunteer myself to actually try and do this. Then it may be through the university, through the college, we can make it some kind of project. Oh, it's a project, obviously, yeah. We have an innovation center. That's a good idea. And it would be great if the other panelists here would be able to commit a little bit of their time to advise and to help structure it. And, you know, maybe something great can come out of this and we can we can bring something to the market that will really accelerate the 200 and something years Cynthia was talking about, or Michelle, the 100 years he doesn't want his daughters to wait to find gender parity in terms of wages. You know, Jed and your experiences, you've been very blessed and very lucky because you're absolutely fearless. So I think that, you know, from my part, I'm committing. I am hands on, would give as much time as I need and be willing to work with you and your team, Vered. I don't know about all of you guys. I'm asking you to make a pledge. Let, let's do it. I do, let's yeah. Do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're the audience, yes. The word for the very important uh, word, connection. 
all humans need is a connection. They need uh, some common denominator where they all feel they're part of something. That yeah. sense of belonging will generate inclusion. Yeah, no, Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got 30 seconds left. I just want to say thank you for, to everybody. Thank you for your time. It's very early for some of us, very late for other of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been wonderful to connect prior and now during. And we now have an action to take and to take this forward. And I will be following up with everybody to try and keep this going because I'm quite relentless and shameless when it comes to those things. So everybody, thank you so much. It's been a real honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And we are done. How does it stop? Yay. I'm trying. It says live, but we're time is up. So I guess we're off. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That was really fun. And I'm not kidding. I'm so following up on this. <laughs> <laughs> good one. Good. Wait, I don't know if that's a good indication or a bad one. <laughs> well, we'll see. But I think, you know, I think making it a project of the college, they have an innovation center where they can lead on all of the background and with the individual expertise of everybody, being able to connect the people that can help this happen, we could do something. Yeah. I mean, the purpose of all of these meetings is that like-minded people come together so change happens. What normally happens that we discussed is like-minded people come together, we all talk about a problem, and then we go on living our lives within the environment of the problem. So I think it would be a very interesting endeavor to try. I don't think it will take much time. Just, you know, focus. This is what I know. This is how I can help. Target it and coordinating it. Happy to help. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. The Kai Wu. Huh? We should bring along him as well. Who? The Kai. The Kai. Professor De Kai. AI. Yeah. No, definitely. We need AI. But we're gonna we're we're doing the production on the back end, and then we're gonna come back to all of you guys when we have like a little template. Cool. I'm looking forward to that. That. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm still having some connection issues here, so uh, I don't know what's wrong, and it says unstable connection. But I, I, I got most of that, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll see what you just reach out, and I'll see how I can contribute from my side. We will, Michelle, and good luck with the move, and uh, good luck with the new opportunity in your life. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.